monarch butterflies. They're everywhere on hot summer afternoons. They flit and dart from flower to flower, settling down gently, and they seem as fragile as fluff. But looks are deceiving. Their young feed only on milkweed, which contains a substance much like digitalis, a drug for treating heart disease. Now, many varieties of milkweed are poisonous. When the monarchs eat the plant, they become poisonous too. And they can store enough poison in their systems to stop the heart of a blue jay. Now, monarchs are tropical butterflies. Yet here they are in southern Ontario, in Canada. Now, how have they spread throughout a cold continent? The answer is simple. They migrate. We've known for generations about the western monarchs wintering grounds on the California coast. But it took a Canadian scientist 30 years to discover where the eastern population goes. A hot spring afternoon. A female monarch butterfly lands on a milkweed. She lays eggs and heads north to Canada to die. In five days, a monarch larva is born. It's only a few millimeters long, but it will feed on the milkweed for another two weeks, and it will grow and grow. Throughout the southern United States, adult females are leaving a trail of eggs behind. They can spot milkweed anywhere. The sap is filled with a poison called cardenolide. Next door, a female praying mantis deposits her eggs too. The mantis were imported into the eastern United States to control other insect pests. The experiment failed. When other prey is scarce, the mantis kill each other. In the next 10 days, the monarch larva will eat 16,000 times its own weight in milkweed. The poison stored in their bodies is the larvae's only defense. Most insects stay away, but sometimes a katydid gets hungry enough to eat anything. While the monarch adults fly around above, young mantis emerge from their eggs. They're tiny, but they're feisty. If nothing their size comes along, they hunt each other. A mud dauber wasp is looking for mud. She rolls it up, and now she'll take it back to home base and use it to complete her nest. The praying mantis sees dinner approaching. A grasshopper. But it gets away. In 14 short days, the monarch larva has increased its original weight 3,000 times. It carries enough poison to kill a bird. The monarch larva has become a giant. It's as if a six-pound human baby transformed itself into an eight-ton whale. The mud dauber comes home with a caterpillar tucked under its leg. She's paralyzed it. She pushes it into the nest to become a source of fresh food for her larva. The monarch larva is about to become a monarch chrysalid. It hangs upside down. Slowly, it begins metamorphosis. The chrysalids gleam like jade. Inside its shell, the larva dissolves. And soon, it will become a butterfly. After one week, the chrysalid splits open. Slowly, carefully, the adult monarch pushes itself out head first. The monarch pumps up its wings by pushing fluid down through its veins. For hours, it's vulnerable.
a small bug walks right into the mantis's territory. The monarch's wings are almost open. The mantis is too busy to notice. On other milkweeds, the transformation of monarch chrysalids is repeated over and over again. A dun-colored mantis preens and readies itself for action. Slowly, another adult monarch emerges. But not all milkweeds are equally poisonous. And this monarch has only a little poison in its system. The wings pump up. The mantis is on it before it has a chance to stretch for the first time. By September, the last adults of summer are coming out of their chrysalids. They won't have a chance to mate before it gets cold. The falling temperature and the changing hours of sunlight act as signals that it's time to head south. Those west of the Rockies head for the California coast. They arrive by October, and they settle by the hundreds of thousands on the pine and eucalyptus trees close to the ocean. Their hormone levels are low. Their mating drive is suppressed. Even the aging process slows down. Before they arrived here, each lived on its own. Now, they cluster as tightly as sociably as bees. Over on the eastern half of the continent, the story is a little different. The monarchs there head south at the same time as their western cousins, but they have much farther to go. They feed close to the ground, then move up on the warm thermal currents following the prevailing wind. They take frequent rest stops to load up on nectar. A long voyage requires a lot of fuel, and they must also store enough fats to last through the winter and beyond. Step by step, they make their way south to Texas. While some have been spotted flying out over the Gulf, most of them follow the land route all the way through southwest Texas and into Mexico. And there, they climb until they reach a few small acres of forest high up in the mountains of the interior. It's late November when they arrive. None of them has ever been here before. Some of them are five generations removed from ancestors who last wintered here. Yet, they return to the same hills, the same woods, the same trees. The sun shines, and tens of millions of butterflies spread their wings to soak up the heat. They compete for places inside the clusters, but they must not fly too much, or they will lose their precious fat reserves. The air is dry. The trees break the wind. These few acres are among the only places on the continent where the exactly right hibernation conditions exist. Winter brings shorter days. At night, the air temperature hovers at just above freezing. But sometimes, even in Mexico, things get rough. January. The storms move in. They've gathered here for protection against the elements. But nothing can protect fragile butterflies from a killer storm. The more we learn about the monarchs, the more we realize that their lives hang on the razor's edge. Somehow, the monarchs from all over eastern North America have migrated to Mexico, but their winter home 
is no tropical paradise. The weather can be deadly. In February, snowstorms blow into the Mexican mountains. The branches of the fir trees, already burdened by the weight of millions of butterflies, break off in the wind. The temperature in the tree canopy is just right to keep the monarchs alive through the winter. But it's too cold for them to fly. And those which fall to the ground freeze and die by the hundreds of thousands. Snow and wind are the monarch's worst enemies. Those in the center of the clusters and in the middle of the tree canopy do best. The temperature in the middle of the canopy is higher than at the top or the bottom. And the monarchs get more shelter from the wind. But down on the ground, it's a different story. There, the temperature is well below freezing. Overnight, branches have broken off, and many monarchs have fallen into the new snow. The bodies of the dead monarchs litter the ground. Tens of millions have gathered here, and with the sudden change in the weather, millions have died, frozen to death. Those still clinging to the trees conserve their energy. Miraculously, a few on the ground are still alive. As the sun breaks through, those on the trees spread their wings like solar collectors. The monarch shivers to warm itself. Some were able to climb a foot above ground level where the air is warmer. If he can hang on while the sun climbs, he might be able to warm up and make it to the trees. By mid-afternoon, those in the clusters are able to move again. Some can even fly. Not far away, another danger closes in. The removal of just a few trees can change the weather conditions in the monarch's wintering sites. If the temperature drops and the wind gets stronger, the monarchs won't be able to stay here next year. Cold is not the only enemy. At night, monarchs on the ground fall prey to the mice, and the dark places of the forest shroud the birds who also hunt for them. These birds can kill up to 35,000 monarchs a night. Scientists have begun to study how birds develop different strategies for dealing with the monarch's chemical defenses. In the lab, it was learned that even blue jays have ways for eating monarchs. This little fellow picks off the wings and the skeleton and throws them away. That's where the poisons are concentrated. He eats only the soft tissues where poison concentrations are low. Scientists had long suspected that some monarchs are more poisonous than others. Now they know that many monarchs are not poisonous at all. It all depends on the kind of milkweed the larvae feed on. With an assist from modern agriculture, the non-poisonous milkweeds are spreading throughout their range in North America. By March, the days are warm and getting longer. The chemistry of the monarch responds. Hormones suppressed all winter begin to flow. Every day in California, the clusters break up as the monarchs take to the skies in search of food and water. The whir of thousands of wings roars in the trees. These California cousins get going a little earlier than those in Mexico. As the days get warmer, the monarchs spend more time in the air.
But the more they fly, the more they need to find food. They're thirsty after a long winter's sleep. Spring runoff turns streams to rivers. The monarch needs something gentler for drinking. As the hormone levels build up, the monarchs begin to look for mates. One male spots a female. And the mating chase begins. Gently, very gently, like two feathers locked together, they float to the ground. The monarchs mate to create new life. But something else happens at the same time. The male transfers nutrients to the female, so she will have enough energy for the long journey home. The end of the ritual is hard on the male. He must carry her high up into the air to a tree. He's hungry from a long winter. He's just given her extra nourishment. And now he must carry both of them aloft. Many males die after these mating bouts. The females will mate up to seven times before they head north. The same thing happens in Mexico. By March, it is warm enough for them to begin their journey home. As they fly north, the females deposit eggs on any milkweed they find. Soon the larvae emerge, and the cycle begins again. These adults born in the southern states will mate here and stay. Their mothers keep going north and appear in the northern states and Canada by the end of May. And soon the whole continent, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, is repopulated. The larvae hatch, they metamorphose. And before summer ends, five generations of tropical butterflies have reconquered the whole cold North American continent. It's the last brood of summer which holds the answer to the great mystery. Somehow, they carry within them the knowledge of how to find their way 2,000 miles to a few small acres in Mexico. It took a Canadian scientist 30 years to find their nesting sites there. It will probably take many more years to find out how monarchs follow a trail of air currents and milkweed through the new wilderness. A few years ago, conservationists appealed to Mexico to turn the monarch's wintering sites into a national park and put an end to the forestry business there. Well, Mexico would like to help, but it has no tradition of buying private land for parks. There are difficulties in Canada and the United States, too. Farmers in large numbers are using herbicides which kill off milkweed. And soon, the monarchs may lose their chemical defense against predators. Now, can we put people out of work or ask farmers to stop using herbicides in order to save butterflies? Well, we may have to. Unraveling the monarch mystery may save human lives one day. Discovering how monarchs get to Mexico may well be worth the Nobel Prize in neurobiology. Studying monarch chemistry may tell us how to make heart drugs without dangerous side effects. We can't let them fade from our lives like the fairies and children's tales. No, they have work to do for us in the new wilderness.
You just watched a unique new nature series that introduced you to a world of adventure, excitement, and intrigue. Lorne Green's New Wilderness. But the fun doesn't stop here. There are many more episodes to choose from. Each program will bring you into the mysterious habitat of the wild. You learn to be a part of nature, hunt for food, take care of the family, share in blossoming relationships. It's all here. Real life animal adventures. It's a whole new wilderness out there. It's more than a place. It's a frame of mind, a series of actions. It's a new phase of history that's being created today. And you and your family can be part of it. The series is a whole new concept in home video entertainment. It's infotainment, informative, educational, entertaining, repeatable. Collect them all. Laugh, cry, and cheer with Lorne Green's New Wilderness. It'll be a valued treasure in your home video library for years and years to come. So come along with me on the adventures of a lifetime. The whole new world of the new world. Lorne Green's New Wilderness. From Prism Entertainment.